Hello, my name is Philip Malzan, and today I'm happy to introduce uh, Professor Francis Fukuyama, prominent US American scholar, political scientist, who's probably most known for his, uh, I would say, controversial work, The End of History, published in the 1990s, but Professor Fukuyama obviously has published a lot more. And I'm happy to uh, welcome him here in the studio in Kyiv today. Yeah, very good. <laughs> dive right in. Thank you for having me. Thank you for coming. We appreciate it. So I'll, we'll dive right in. Um, how do you think the Russian invasion of Ukraine has affected the global narrative around liberal democracy versus authoritarianism? And does it reinforce your early ideas about the resilience of liberal democracy? Essentially, what was the ground theory of the end of history? Well, uh, <clears throat> I think that what had happened in the more than 30 years since I wrote the end of history and the end of the Cold War is that many people that lived in liberal democracies became rather complacent. They assumed that democracy would be the single you know, framework for their uh, societies, and it wasn't really threatened by anybody. But I think with the, um, especially with the beginning of the full-scale invasion, uh, suddenly people realized that democracy didn't necessarily always exist, that you had to fight for it, and I think uh, you know, Ukraine's fight for its own sovereignty and independence has been very inspiring to many people. Uh, but it's also put stress on democracy because, you know, the war uh, consumes a lot of resources as well as lives. Uh, it's um, uh, changed the global balance of power. You know, Europe had to uh, wean itself off of Russian energy and that caused, you know, other geopolitical changes. and. The whole world uh, politically has kind of realigned as a result of that. And so I think all of those have made us aware of, in a way, the fragility of the current situation that we're facing in terms of the stability of democracy. So it's, you would basically say that uh, a conflict that was thought to be a little bit lost has kind of revived or has come back? Well, uh, I think that you know, the year 1989 and then 1991 when the Soviet Union fell apart, uh, for many people it was a relief because sure. all these countries were released from this Soviet prison uh, in a certain sense. But, um, you know, we didn't anticipate, I think, some of the challenges that would appear. So many of the countries that, you know, had been communist uh, and had rejected communism now started to show a certain nostalgia for the mm -hmm. world that existed back then. Mm -hmm. And then it turns out that Russia was never really reconciled to the loss of its empire. And I think that's what Vladimir Putin represents, is this intense uh, longing for a past where they believed that they were powerful and glorious and they lost that somehow. Mm -hmm. And that uh, has obviously been driving a lot of the instability in Europe. Yeah. Someone once said to me, it's just, just, just an anecdote, and remember it's nostalgia for for a past that was never as great as no. they make it out to be now, which is yeah. well, I mean, Russia is the last colonial empire. You know, Britain, France, all of these other countries used to have empires, and they gave it up because we live in an age of democracy when people are supposed to be self-determining, and Russia is the only country that seems to think it deserves to maintain an empire. Mm. Yeah. The war in Ukraine has seemingly unified Europe in, in ways not seen in recent decades. And do you think this unity can persist or will persist in the long term? And how might it influence the future of the European Union and European democracy as a whole? Well, the unity was really remarkable in the first year of the war. I think that since then, as the war has dragged on, uh, you, you're seeing cracks in that because in individual countries there has been a little bit of you know, weariness about supporting sure. Ukraine. I think that you're seeing the rise of populist parties like the AFD in Germany, uh, where uh, they're actually more on the Russian side than on the Ukrainian side. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that, you know, overall the situation is, is still, you know, reasonably good, but there's growing opposition to support for Ukraine, and that's going to be a real problem going forward. Yeah. How would you explain that this, because it seems also that the traditional political blocs in their allegiance to Russia are, are changing in the sense that the AFD, which is a populist mm -hmm. right-wing party, you know, has pro-Russian, mm -hmm. strong pro-Russian sentiments, and also in, in Hungary, I would say, you know, mm -hmm. which is more a, a right-wing government leaning mm -hmm. towards Russia. Where, where does this shift, shift come from that? Well, support for the Soviet Union was obviously a left-wing cause, but 
Putin has transformed Russia into a kind of fascist right-wing nationalist state. Mm. And I think that um, nationalists don't obviously work together at all times, but uh, in recent years they've been supporting each other in terms of opposition to Western liberal democracy. You know, because liberal democracy means openness to the outside world, trade, you know, uh, joining the European Union, this larger entity, and a lot of individual nations resent that and, you know, want to assert their own uh, national traditions. Ukraine has expressed a strong desire to align with Western liberal democracies. And how do you evaluate Ukraine's prospects for democratic consolidation in the context of the ongoing conflict? Well, um, there are two institutions that matter in this respect. So one is the European Union, the other is NATO. In terms of the European Union, I think that that's going to happen. Uh, I think you know there are accession criteria that U Ukraine has to meet. Uh, but I think that's actually healthy for Ukraine because it means that in terms of corruption, transparency, a lot of governance characteristics, these are things that Ukraine has been struggling to do and you know should be doing in any event. And I think uh, those criteria will be met. The NATO part is more difficult because uh, NATO you know says it won't accept countries that are actually in a war, uh, which Ukraine is. Uh, but on the other hand, you can't really end the war until there's a sufficient security guarantee for the future so that the Russians can't simply start the war up again when they feel stronger. Uh, and that's, you know, I think one of the chief problems politically that we've got to confront. I do think it's ultimately solvable, but, uh, you know, it's a conundrum right now. Yeah. Um, how has the war in Ukraine altered the global geopolitical landscape, particularly in relation to the balance of power between liberal democracies and we call it authoritarian regimes like Russia? Well, there's a growing axis of authoritarian powers. Uh, it's not like the Cold War in that they don't all share the same ideology. So, for example, Iran, this uh, you know extremist religious state, is mixed in with. China, which still claims to be a Marxist you know, country, and uh, they all support each other. What unites them is really opposition to liberal democracy uh, itself. They don't want to be any part of this Western uh, mixture of free societies, open economies, uh, and the like. Um, but there's definitely an increasing uh, degree of cooperation among these, you know, these outsider countries or mm -hmm. countries that had been outsiders. I find that very, it's an interesting thought, right? Because as you said, these countries are not necessarily all the same. Mm -hmm. Neither are the Western or liberal democracies, even mm -hmm. if we just, as we just spoke about Hungary and Germany or, mm -hmm. or Sweden and, and Norway, I have uh, huge differences in terms of political system and in terms mm -hmm. of society. But still, they, they treat us a little bit as a block. Mm -hmm. Do we see this kind of revival of, of this? Well, I do think there is, a, there is a natural affinity among countries that share basic democratic values, you know, mm -hmm. that they believe in a rule of law, they believe in checks and balances and constitutional government. Uh, Hungary, I think, actually doesn't belong in the European Union. They've, uh, you know, they've adopted a, a, an authoritarian system. Mm -hmm. They're taking uh, subsidies from the European Union, but they spit back, you know, this ridiculous uh, nationalist, uh, you know, ideology in, in the face of the EU. Uh, but you know, the rest of the bloc, I think, is pretty unified in terms of its uh, common values and, uh, you know, uh, a de degree of mutual support that's important. And actually, I think it's the authoritarians that are more diverse uh, because you do have some coming from the old left, some coming from the right. Uh, and, mm. you know, what they have in common is really not any coherent set of values. It's, it's more just dislike of liberal democracy. In your book, uh, Identity, the Demand for Dignity and the Politics of Resentment, you discuss the importance of national identity. How do you see Ukrainian national identity evolving due to the war, maybe from your perspective, both as a scholar and mm -hmm. from your experience here? As mm -hmm. you said, you visited uh, the, the country many times. What implications does this have for the country's future? Well, national identity is important because if the different peoples living in a society don't believe that there's an overall entity that they're loyal to, then, you know, they're going to behave in ways that are very destructive of the uh, solidarity of that country. If they want to stick to one, you know, ethnicity or one region, uh, that 
you know, is, is going to weaken the country as a whole. Uh, but there's also a challenge for a liberal democracy to have a national identity because unlike, let's say, a fascist country, you can't emphasize race or ethnicity as the core of, you know, who you are. Uh, and I think that means that the task for a democracy is to build national identity around more abstract political ideas. And I think that's something that is true in Ukraine. I mean, why do people not want to live in Russia? You know, they don't want to live under an authoritarian regime that tells them what to do, what to think, controls their educations, uh, you know, prohibits them from uh, moving around and, and, and doing things that they want. Uh, and that is an important freedom that Ukrainians have, I think, that can be the basis for you know, a distinct Ukrainian uh, identity. And then there are also cultural things that, you know, I think Ukrainians are discovering now that their history is unique in many ways. It is not necessarily just part of this larger Russian historical narrative the way the Russians believe it is. And I think it's important to be able to hold on to, uh, you know, those aspects of national identity. Given your analysis of political regimes, what do you predict for Russia's political future in the aftermath of the war in Ukraine, or maybe even during the war in Ukraine? Could internal pressures lead to significant changes? In well, theoretically, they could. I mean, the Russian Federation is very heterogeneous, and the war has put certain strains on that. So, for example, the Russians don't want to recruit their own ethnic Russian Russians as soldiers because... I think Putin fears that that's going to create a, a pushback on his own, from his own population. So they're using a lot of ethnic minorities, Buryats, Chechens, you know, uh, and so forth. Uh, and that works in the short run, but it also is going to, I think, lay the groundwork for you know, some ethnic tensions. But overall, I'm not, uh, I'm not expecting the Russian Federation to fall apart anytime soon because it does have a lot of... Um, uh, resources, you know, to hold itself together. Assuming a post-war scenario, what role do you envision for Ukraine in the broader international community? And how could Ukraine's experience and resilience influence other countries facing similar threats to their sovereignty and democracy? Well, I think Ukraine has been a tremendous uh, inspiration to, you know, democratic peoples all over the place that uh, we usually don't face the kind of serious threats that Ukraine has faced. And the way that Ukraine has risen to that challenge, you know, I think is a big inspiration. Not just the soldiers fighting on the front line and dying and, you know, being willing to stick it out, but also the degree of innovation and, you know, enterprise that, uh, you know, for example, creating a whole drone, uh, you know, core and in industry, uh, you know, as a the result The world's of, first drone force is now yeah. a separate branch of yeah. the army, actually. That's have, right, that's yeah. right. Uh, and that's something that's, you know, quite quite remarkable that nobody else has done. And I think those things are going to be copied by other, uh, by other countries. Yeah. I'm just thinking about it, actually, um, when we were speaking about post-war scenarios and a little bit about the future, I would love to ask about the US election. I think the American election is going to have a big impact on Ukraine. You know, it's actually very easy to manipulate Trump. You just have to praise him and build up his ego. And, and Putin's been very successful at doing that. Uh, Vice President um, uh, Vance just put out his own peace plan that's identical to Putin's. You know, basically have a ceasefire and then Russia gets to keep whatever territory it's, it's succeeded in uh, occupying since the beginning of, well, since 1991. Uh, and, um, you know, I, I think that that's going to be terrible for Ukraine because it's going to mean a loss of territory and sovereignty and so forth. And, uh, a Harris administration will not do that. I, you know, there's obviously been unhappiness with the Biden administration not giving permission to use the weapons that have been provided, you know, as uh, at the range that would really be necessary to, to defeat Russia. That's a fight, you know, that's ongoing. I think eventually they're going to give in on this, but that's a lot better than being cut off. And it was the Republicans in Congress that uh, cut off all weapons supplies last fall. And so that, I think, is what you can expect if, uh, if the Republicans win the election. How do, you, um, how do you assess the response of Western democracies to the war in Ukraine? And has the West's strategy been effective in defending liberal democratic values, or has it revealed weaknesses? I think you already mentioned just in our conversation that there has 
been a little bit of a shift in policy sometimes mm -hmm. from you know absolute solidarity at some points to you know a little bit more more question well, marks that are arising. I, I think the biggest critique I have of the Western response has really been the American one because the United States is the main supplier of military equipment and I think that the United States has uh, had an excessive fear of escalation on the part of uh, Russia and as a result has um, not provided you know sufficient weapons and given permission to use them in a fully effective way uh, over the last you know two and a half years of the war and I think that continues with these restrictions on the range you know by which long-range missiles can be used by Ukraine at the present moment I don't really see any way of deterring these Russian uh, missile attacks unless they are also subject to a similar kind of uh, strike um, uh, uh, threat uh, and you know that's a direct result of calculations made in Washington that I think are are excessively cautious. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. Thank you very much okay. for your time and for joining us. Today. Okay, we sure. really appreciate it. Yeah, very happy wish to do you, that. Wish you a safe and pleasant stay for okay. that. Okay, thank Kiev. you. Thank you very much.